The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 1 Rome at the beginning was ruled by kings. Freedom and the consulship were established by Lucius Brutus. Dictatorships were held for a temporary crisis. The power of the demospheres did not last beyond two years. Nor was the consular jurisdiction of the military tribunes of long duration. The despotisms of Siena and Solia were brief. The rule of Pompeius and Crassus soon yielded before Caesar. The arms of Lepidus and Antonius before Augustus, whom, when the world was wearied by civil strife, subjected it to the empire under the title of prince. But the successes and reverses of the old Roman people had been recorded by famous historians, and fine intellects were not wanting to describe the times of Augustus, till growing sycophancy scared them away. The histories of Tiberius, Cassius, Claudius, and Nero, while they were in power, were falsified through terror, and after their death were written under the irritation of a recent hatred. Hence my purpose is to relate a few facts about Augustus, more particularly his last acts, and then the reign of Tiberius and all which follows, without either bitterness or partiality, to any motives which I am far removed. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 2 when after the destruction of Brutus and Caesius, there was no longer any army of the commonwealth, when Pompeius was crushed in Sicily, and when Lepidus pushed aside and with Antonius slain, even the Julian faction had only Caesar left to lead it. Then, dropping the title of Trumavir, and giving out that he was a consul, and was satisfied with the tribune's authority for the protection of the people, Augustus won over the soldiers with gifts, the populace with cheap corn, and all men with the sweets of repose, and so grew greater by degrees, while he concentrated in himself the functions of the senate, the magistrates, and the laws. He was wholly unopposed, for the boldest spirits had fallen in battle, or in prescription, while the remaining nobles, the readier they were to be slaves, were raised to the higher wealth and promotion, so that, aggrandized by revolution, they preferred the safety of the present to the dangerous past. Nor did the provinces dislike that conditions of affairs, for they distrusted the government of the Senate and the people, because of the rivalries between the leading men and the rapacity of the officials, while the protection of the laws was unveiling, as they were continually deranged by violence, intrigue, and finally by corruption. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 3 Augustus, meanwhile, as he supports to his deputism, raised to the pontificate and curile adileship, Claudius Mercralius, his sister's son, while a mere stripling and Marcus Agrippa, of humble birth, a good soldier, and one who had shared his victory, consecutive consulships, and as Marsalius soon afterwards died, he had also accepted him as his son-in-law. Tiberius Nero and Claudius Drusus, his stepsons, he honored with imperial titles, although his own family was as yet undiminished, for he had admitted the children of Agrippa, Caius and Lucius, into the house of the Caesars and before they had yet laid aside the dress of boyhood, and most fervently desired, and with an outward show of reluctance, that they should be entitled princes of youth, and be consuls-elect. When Agrippa died, and Lucius Caesar, as he was on his way to our armies in Spain, and Caius, while returning from Armenia, still suffering from a wound, were prematurely cut off by destiny, or by their stepmother, Livia's treachery. Drusus too, having long been dead, Nero remained alone of the stepsons, and in him everything tended to center. He was adopted as a son, as a colleague in the empire and a partner of tributanian power, and paraded through all the armies, and no longer through his mother's secret intrigues, but at her open suggestion, for she had gained such a hold on the aged Augustus that he drove out as an exile to the island of Plantasius, his only grandson, Agrippa Postmusus who, though devoid of worthy qualities and having only brute courage of physical strength, had not been convicted of any gross offense, and yet Augustus had appointed Germacanaeus Drusus's offspring to the command of eight legions on the Rhine, and required Tiberius to adopt him. Although Tiberius had a son, now a young man in his house, but he did it that he might have several safeguards to rest on. He had no war at time on his hands except against the Germans, which was rather to wipe out the disgrace of the loss of Contilius Varius, and his army that out of ambition extended to the empire, or for any adequate recompense. At home all was tranquil, and there were magistrates with the same titles. There was a younger generation, sprung up since the victory of Acatum, and many of the older men had been born during civil war. How few were left who had seen the Republic in all its glory. 
The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 4. Thus the state had been revolutionized, and there was not a single vestige left of the old sound morality. Stripped of all equality, all looked up to the commands of a sovereign without the least apprehension for the present. While Augustus, in the vigor of life, could maintain his own position, that of his house and the general tranquility, when an advanced old age, he was worn out by a sickly frame, and the end was near for the new prospects open. A few spoken in vain of the blessings of freedom, but most dreaded, and some longed for war. The popular gossip of the large majority fastened itself variously on their future roasters. Agrippa was a savage, and had been exasperated by insult, and neither from age nor experience in affairs was equal to such a great burden. Tiberius Nero was of mature years, and had established his fame in war, but he had the old arrogance inbred in the Claudian family, and many symptoms of a cruel temper, though they were repressed. Now and then they broke out. He had also, from earliest infancy, had been reared of an imperial house. Consulships and triumphs had been heaped in him in his younger days. Even in the years which, on the pretext of seclusion, he spent in exile at Rhodes, he had no thoughts but of wrath, hypocrisy, and secret sensuality. There was his mother, too, with a woman's caprice. They must, it seemed, be subject to a female and two striplings beside, who for a while would burden and some day rend a strunder, the state. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 5 While these and like topics were discussed, the infirmities of Augustus increased and some suspected guilt on his wife's part. For a rumor had gone abroad that a few months before he had sailed to Plansacia on a visit to Agrippa, with the knowledge of some chosen friends, and with one companion, Fabius Maximus, that with many tears shed on both sides the expressions of affection, and that thus there was hope of a young man being restored to the home of his grandfather. This, it was said, Maximus had divulged to his wife Marcia, and she again to Livia, all was known to Caesar, and while Maximus soon afterward died by a death some had thought to be self-inflicted, there were heard at his funeral wailings from Marcia, in which she reproached herself for having been the cause of her husband's destruction. For the fact was, Tiberius, as he was just entering Alaria, was summoned home by an urgent letter from his mother, and it has not been thoroughly ascertained whether by the city of Nola he found Augustus still breathing or quite lifeless. For Livia had surrounded the house and its approaches with a strict watch. All favorable bulletins were published from time to time. Still, provisions having been made for the demands of the crisis, one and the same report told men that Augustus was dead and that Tiberius Nero was the master of the state. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 6 The first crime of the new reign was the murder of Postumus Agrippa, though he was surprised and unarmed. A centurion of the firmest resolution dispatched him with difficulty. Tiberius gave no explanation to the matter of the Senate. He pretended that there was no directions from his father ordering a tribune in charge of a prisoner, not to delay the slaughter of Agrippa, whether he should have himself breathed his last. Beyond a doubt, Augustus had often complained of the younger man's character, and thus succeeded in obtaining a sanction of a decree to the Senate for his banishment. But he was never hard-hearted enough to destroy any of his kinsfolk, nor was it credible that the death was to be the sentence of the grandson in order that the stepson might feel secure. It was more probable that Tiberius and Livia, one from fear, the other from a stepmother's enmity, hurried on the destruction of a youth whom they suspected and hated. When the centurion reported, according to the military custom, that he had executed the command, Tiberius replied that he had not given the command, and that the act must be justified to the senate. As soon as Solicitus Crispus, who shared the secret, he had in fact sent the written order to the tribune, knew this, fearing that the charge would be shifted on himself, and that his peril would be the same whether he uttered fiction or truth, he advised Livia not to divulge secrets of her house, of the consuls, of friends, or any services performed by the soldiers, to let Tiberius weaken the strength of imperial power by referring everything to the senate for the condition, he said, of holding empire is that an account cannot be balanced unless it be rendered to one person. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 7 Meanwhile, at Rome, people plunged into slavery. Consul, senators, knights. The higher a man's rank, the more eager his hypocrisy, and his looks the more carefully studied, so as neither to portray joy at the decease of one emperor, nor the sorrow at the rise of another. While he mingled delight and lamentations with his flattery, 
Sextus Pompeius and Sextus Apollius, the consuls, were the first to swear allegiance to Tiberius Caesar, and in their presence the oath was taken by Caesar Strabo and Caesus Ternaeus, respectively the commander of the Pradian courts and the superintendent of the corn supplies. Then the senate, the soldiers, and the people did the same. For Tiberius would inaugurate everything with consuls, as though the ancient constitution remained, and he hesitated about being emperor. Even the proclamation by which he summoned the senators to their chambers, he issued merely with the title of tribune, which he had received under Augustus. The wording of proclamation was brief, and it was in a very modest tone. He would, it said, provide for the honors due to his father, and not leave the lifeless body, and this was the only public duty he now claimed. As soon, however, as Augustus was dead, he had given the watchword to the Pradian courts. As commander-in-chief, he had guards under arms. With all the other adjuncts of court, soldiers attended him to the forums. Soldiers went with him to the Senate House. He sent letters to the different armies, as though supreme power was now his, and showed hesitation only when he spoke in the Senate. His chief motive was fear that the Germanicus, who had at his disposal so many legions, such vast auxiliary forces of allies, and such wonderful popularity, might prefer the possession and expectation of empire. He looked also at public opinion, wishing to have the credit of having been called and elected by the Senate, rather than having crept into power through the intrigues of a wife and a dotard's adoption. It was subsequently understood that he assumed a wavering attitude, to test likewise the temper of nobles, for he would twist a word or a look into a crime and treasure it up in his memory. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 8 On the first day of the Senate, he allowed nothing to be discussed but the funeral of Augustus, whose will, which had been brought in by Vestal Virgins, named his heirs Tiberius and Livia. The latter was to be admitted to the Julian family with the name of Augusta. Next in expectation were their grand and great-grandchildren. And third place, he had named the chief of men of the state, most of whom he hated simply out of ostentation and to win credit with posterity. His legacies were not beyond the scale of a private citizen, except a bequest of 43,500,000 sesquires to the people and populace of Rome, of 1,000 to every Pradian soldier and of 300 to every man and the legionary cohorts composed of Roman citizens. Next followed a deliberation about funeral honors. Of these, the most imposing were thought fitting, the procession was to be conducted through the Gate of Triumph, on the motion of Gallius Astentius. The titles of laws passed, the names of nations conquered by Augustus were to be borne on the front, and that of Lucius Atrinius. Melissa Valerius further proposed that the oath of allegiance to Tiberius should be yearly renewed, and when Tiberius asked him whether it was his biding that he had brought forth this motion, he replied that he had proposed it spontaneously and that in whether concerned the state he would only use his discretion, even at the risk of offending. This was the only style of adulation which yet remained. The senators unanimously exclaimed that the body ought to be borne on their shoulders to the funeral pile. The emperor left the point to them with disdainful moderation, and he then admonished the people by a proclamation not to indulge in that tumultuous enthusiasm which had distracted the funeral of the divine Julius or express a wish that Augustus should be burnt on the forum instead of his appointed resting place and the campus Maritius. On the day of the funeral, soldiers stood round as guard. Amid much ridicule from those who had either themselves witnessed or who had heard from their parents of the famous day when slavery was still something fresh and freedom had been resought in vain when the slaying of Caesar, the dictator, had seemed the vilest to others, the most glorious of deeds. Now, they said, an aged sovereign, whose power had lasted long, who had been appointed his heirs with abundant means to coerce the state, requires, forsooth, the defense of soldiers that his burial may be undisturbed. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 9 Then followed much talk about Augustus himself, and many expressed an idle wonder that the same day marked the beginning of his assumption of empire and the close of his life, and again, that he had ended his days at Nola, in the same house and the same room as his father Octavius. People extolled, too, the number of his consulships, in which he had equaled Valerius Corvus and Caius Maivius combined, the continuous for thirty-seven years of tributanian power, the title of imperator twenty-one times earned, and his other honors which had been either frequently repeated or were wholly new. 
Sensible men, however, spoke variously of his life with praise and censure. Some said that dutiful feelings towards a father and the necessities in the state in which laws had then no place drove him into a civil war, which can neither be planned nor conducted on any right principles. He had often yielded to Antonius while he was taking vengeance on his father's murderers, often also to Lupatus. When the latter shrank into a feeble dotage and the former had been ruined by his profligacy. The only remedy for his distracted country was the rule of a single man. Yet the state had organized under the name neither of a kingdom nor a dictatorship, but under that of a prince. The ocean and remote rivers were boundaries of the empire, the legions provinces, fleets and all things were linked together. There was a law for the citizens, there was respect shown to the allies, the capital had been embellished on a grand scale. Only in a few instances had he resorted to force, simply to secure general tranquility. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 10 It was said, on the other hand, that filial duty and the state necessity were merely assumed as a mask. It was really from a lust of sovereignty that he had excited the veterans by bribery, had, when a young man and a subject raised an army, tampered with the consul's legions, and feigned an attachment to the factions of Pompeius. Then, when by a decree of the Senate he had usurped the high functions and authority of Praetor, when Hetrius and Pansa were slain, whether they were destroyed by the enemy or Pansa by poison infused into a wound, Hiriatus by his own soldier and Caesar's treacherous machinations, he at once possessed himself of both their armies, wrested the consulate from a reluctant senate, and turned against the state the arms that which he had been entrusted against Antonius. Citizens were prescribed, lands divided, without so much as the approval of those who executed these deeds. Even granting that the deaths of Cassius and of Bruti were sacrifices to the hereditary enmity, though duty requires us to waive private feuds for the sake of public welfare. Still, Pompeius had been deluded by the phantom of peace and Lepidus by the mask of friendship. Subsequently, Antonius had lured on the treaties of Tarentum and Brutasium, and by his marriage with the sister and paid for the death and the penalty of a treacherous alliance. No doubt there was a peace after all of this, but it was a peace stained with blood. There was disasters of Lullius and Varius, the murders at Rome of the Veros, Anagati, and Julii. The domestic life, too, of Augustus was not spared. Nero's wife had been taken from him, and there had been fierce of consulting the pontiffs, whether with the child conceived and not yet born, she could properly marry. There was an excess of coitus titus and vetus polio. Last of all, there was Livia, terrible to the state as a mother, terrible to the house of the Caesars as a stepmother. No honor was left for the gods, when Augustus chose himself to be worshipped with temples and statues, like those of the deities and with flamens and priests. He had not even adopted Tiberius as his successor out of affection or any regard to the state, but, having thoroughly seen his arrogant and savage temper, he had sought glory for himself by contrast of extreme wickedness. For, in fact, Augustus, a few years before, when he was a second time asking for the senate of a tributanian power for Tiberius, though his speech was complimentary, he had thrown out certain hints as to his manner, style, and habits of life, which he meant as reproaches, while he seemed to excuse, however, when his obsequies had been duly performed, a temple with a religious ritual was decreed to him. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 11 after all this, prayers were addressed to Tiberius. He, on his part, urged various considerations. The greatness of the empire, his distrust of himself. Only, he said, the intellect of the divine Augustus was equal to such a burden. Called as he had been by him to share his anxieties, he had learned by experience how exposed to fortune's caprices was the task of universal rule. Consequently, in a state which had the support of so many great men, they should not put everything on one man, as many, by uniting their efforts, would more easily discharge public functions. There was more grand sentiment than good faith in such words. Tiberius's language, even in matters which he did not care to conceal, either from the nature of habit, was always hesitating and obscure. And now that he was struggling to hide his feelings completely, it was more involved in uncertainty and doubt. The senators, however, whose only fear 
was lest they might be seen to understand him, burst into complaints, tears, and prayers. They raised their hands to the gods, to the statue of Augustus, and to the knees of Tiberius. This contained a description of the resources of the state, of the number of citizens and allies under arms, of the fleets, subject kingdoms, provinces, taxes, direct and indirect, necessary expenses, and customary bounties. All these details Augustus had written in his own hand, and had added a council, that the empire should be confined to its present limits, either from fear or out of jealousy. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 12 Meanwhile, while the Senate stooped to the most abject supplication, Tiberius happened to say that although he was not equal to the whole burden of the state, yet he would undertake the charge of whatever part it may be entrusted to him. Thereupon, Ancinius Gallius asked, I ask you, Caesar, what part of the state you wish to have entrusted into you? Then, recovering his presence of mind, he replied that it would be by no means become his modesty to choose or to avoid a case where he would prefer to be wholly excused. Then, Gallius again, who had inferred anger from his looks, said the question had not been asked with the intention of dividing what could not be separated, but to convince him by his own admission that the body of the state was one and must be directed by a single mind. He further spoke in praise of Augustus, and reminded Tiberius himself of the victories, and his admirable deeds for the many years as a civilian. Still, he did not thereby soften the emperor's resentment, for he had long detested from an impression that, as he had married Vespania, the daughter of Marcus Agrippa, who had once been the wife of Tiberius, he aspired to be more than a citizen, and kept up arrogant of the tone of his father, Asinius Polio. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 13 Next, Lucius Atrunius, who deferred but little from the speech of Gallius, gave, like offense, though Tiberius had no old grudge against him, but simply mistrusted him, because he was rich and daring, had brilliant accomplishments and corresponding popularity. For Augustus, when in his last conversations he was discussing who would refuse the highest place, though sufficiently capable, who would aspire to it without being equal to it, and who would unite both the ability and ambition, had described Marcus Lepidus as able but contemptuously indifferent, Gallius Astentius as ambitious and incapable, Lucius Atrunius as not unworthy of it and should by chance be given to him. Sure to make the venture, about the two first there is a general agreement. But instead of Atrunius, some have mentioned Nisus Piso, and all these men except Lepidus, were soon afterwards destroyed by various charges that the controversies of Tiberius. Hatius, too, and Machmus Scarius ruffled his suspicious temper. Hatterius, by having said, How long, Caesar, will you suffer the state to be without a head? Scarius, by the remark that there was a hope that the Senate's prayer would not be fruitless, seeing that he had used his right as tribune to negate the motion of the consuls. Tiberius instantly broke into incentive against Hatius, Scatius, who he had assumed was far more deeply displeased. He passed over in silence. Wearied at last by the assembly's clamorous inopportunity and the urgent demands of individual senators, he gave away by degrees, not admitting that he undertook empire, but yet ceasing to refuse it and to be entreated. It is known that Hatius, having entered the palace to ask pardon, and thrown himself at the knees of Tiberius as he was walking, was almost killed by the soldiers, because Tiberius fell forward, accidentally or from being entangled in the suppliant's hands. Yet the peril of so great a man did not make him relent, till Hatius went into the entreaties of Augusta, and was saved by her earnest intercessions. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 14 Great, too, was the Senate's sycophancy to Augusta. Some would have her styled parent, others mother of the country, and a majority proposed that the name of Caesar should be added son of Julia. The emperor repeatedly asserted that there must be a limit to the honors paid to women, and that he would observe similar moderation in those bestowed on himself. But annoyed to the invidious proposal, and indeed regarding a woman's elevation as a slight to himself, he would not allow so much as a lictor be assigned to her, and forbade the erection of an altar in memory of her adoption, and any like distinction. But for Germanius Caesar, he has proconsular powers, and envoys were dispatched to confer them on him, and also to express sympathy with his grief at the death of Augustus. The same request was not made for Drusus. 
because he was a consul-elect and present at Rome. Twelve candidates were named for the praetorship, the number which Augustus had handed down, and when the Senate urged Tiberius to increase it, he bound himself by an oath to not exceed it. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 15 It was then for the first time that the elections were transferred from Campus Maitreus to the Senate. For up to that day, though most important rested with the Emperor's choice, some were settled by the partialities of the tribes. Nor did the people complain of having the right taken from them, except in mere idle talk. And the Senate, being now released from the necessity of bribery and degrading solicitation, gladly upheld the change. Tiberius, confining himself to the recommendation of only four candidates who were to be nominated without rejection or canvas. Meanwhile, the tribunes of the people asked to leave an exhibit at their own expense games to be named after Augustus and added to the calendar as the Augustales. Money was, however, voted from the exchequer, and though the use of a triumphal robe in the circus was prescribed, it was not allowed them to ride in a chariot. Soon the annual celebration was transferred to the praetor, to whose lot fell the administration of justice between citizens and foreigners. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 16 This was the state of affairs at Rome when a mutiny broke out in the legions of Pannonia, which could be traced to no fresh cause except through the change of emperors and the prospect it held out in the licensed tumult, and the profits from a civil war. In the summer camp, three legions were quartered, under the command of Junius Blasius, who on the hearing of death of Augustus and the accession of Tiberius, had allowed his men at rest from military duties, either for mourning or rejoicing. This was the beginning of the demoralization among the troops, the quarreling, listening of the talk of every pestilent fellow. In short, the craving for luxury and idleness, and loathing discipline and toil. And the camp was one Pernascius, who had once been the leader of one of the theatrical factions, and soon became a common soldier. He had a saucy tongue, and had learnt from his applause of actors how to stir up a crowd. By working on ignorant minds, which doubted as to which the terms of military service after Augustus, but this man gradually influenced them in conversations at night or at nightfall, and when the better men had dispersed, he gathered round him all the worst spirits. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 17 at last, when there were others ready to be abettors of a mutiny, he asked, with the tone of a demagogue, why, like slaves, they submitted to a few centurions and still fewer tribunes. When, he said, will you dare to demand relief, if you do not go to your prayers or arms to a new yet tottering throne? We have blundered enough by our tameness for so many years, and having to endure thirty or forty campaigns till we grow old. Most of us with bodies maimed by wounds. Even dismissal is not the end of our service. But quartered under legion standards, we toil through the same hardships under another title. If a soldier survives so many risks, he is still dragged into remote regions where, under the name of lands, he receives soaking swamps or mountainous wastes. Assuredly, military service itself is burdensome and unprofitable. Ten asses a day is the value set on life and limb. Out of this clothing, arms, tents, as well as the mercy of centurions and exemptions from duty have to be purchased. But indeed of flogging and wounds, of hard winters, wearisome summers, of terrible war, or barren peace, there is no end. Our only relief can come from military life being entered under a fixed conditions, from receiving each of the pay of a Daenerys, and from the sixteenth year terminating our service. We must be retained no longer under a standard, but in the same camp, a compensation in money must be paid to us. Through the Pratian cohorts, which will go against their way, denarii per men, at which sixteen years are restored to their homes, encounter more perils? We do not disparage the guards of the capital. Still here, amid barbarous tribes, we have to face the enemy from our tents. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 18 the throng applauded from various motives, some pointing with indignation to the marks of the lash, others to their grey locks, and most of them to their threadbare garments and naked limbs. At last, in their fury, they went so far as to propose to combine the three legions into one, driven from their purpose by the jealousy with which every one sought the chief honour for his own legion, 
they turned to other thoughts, and set up in one spot the three eagles, with the ensigns of the cohort. At the same time, they piled up turf and raised a mound, that they might have a more conspicuous meeting place. Amid the bustle, Blasius came up. He upbraided them, and held back man after man with the exclamation, Better imbure your hands in my blood. It will be less guilt to slay your commander than it is to be in revolt from the emperor. Either living I will uphold the loyalty of the legions, or pierced to the heart I will hasten on your repentance. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 19 Nonetheless, however, was the mound piled up, and it was quite breast high when at last overcome by his persistency, they gave up their purpose. Blysus, with a consummate tact of an orator, said, Through mutiny and tumult, that the desires of the army ought to be communicated to Caesar. Nor did our soldiers of old ever ask so novel a boon of ancient commanders. Nor have yourselves asked if the divine Augustus is far apart from opportune the emperor's cares. Now in the first beginning should be aggravated. If, however, you are bent upon attempting in peace, what even after your victory in the civil wars you did not demand, why? Contrary to the habit of obedience, contrary to the laws of discipline, do you mediate violence? Decide on sending envoys and give them instructions in your presence. It was carried by acclamation that the son of Blasus, one of the tribunes, should undertake the mission and demand for the soldiers' release from service after 16 years. He was to have rest of their message when the first part had been successful. After the young man's departure, there was one comparative quiet, but there was an arrogant tone among the soldiers, to whom the fact that their commander's son was pleading their common cause clearly showed that they had rested by compulsion what they had failed to obtain by good behavior. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 20 Meanwhile, the companies which previous to the mutiny had been set up on the Narpatars to make roads and bridges, and for other purposes, when they heard of the tumult in the camp, tore up the standards, and having plundered with the neighboring village of the Napatars itself, which was like a town, assailed the centurions, who restrained them with jeers and insults, last of all with blows. Their chief rage was against Aphidinus Rufus, the camp prefect, whom they dragged from a wagon, loaded with baggage, and drove to the head of the column, asking him in ridicule whether he liked to bear such huge burdens and such long marches. Rufus, who had long been a common soldier, then a centurion, and subsequently a camp prefect, tried to revive the old severe discipline, injured as he was work and toil, all the sterner, because he had endured. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 21 On arrival of these troops, the mutiny broke out afresh, and straggling from the camp, they plundered the neighborhood. Blasius ordered a few who had conspicuously loaded themselves with spoil to be scourged and imprisoned as the terror to the rest. For, ever as it was then, the commander still obeyed the centurions, and by all the best men among the soldiers. As the men were dragged off, they struggled violently, clasped the knees of the bystanders, called to their comrades by name, or to the company, cohort, or legion to which they respectively belonged, exclaiming that they were threatened with the same fate. At the same time, they heaped abuse on the commander. They appealed to heaven and to the gods, and left nothing undone by which they might excite resentment and pity, alarm and rage. They all rushed to the spot, broke open the guardhouses, unbound the prisoners, and were in a moment fraternizing with the deserters and men convicted on capital charges. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 22 Thence arose a more furious outbreak, with more leaders of the mutiny. Vablinius, a common soldier, was hoisted front the general's tribunal on the soldiers of the bystanders and addressed the excited throng, who eagerly awaited his intentions. You have indeed, he said, restored light and air to these innocent and most unhappy men. But who restores to my brother his life, or my brother to myself? Sent to you by the German army in our common cause, he was last butchered by the gladiators, whom the general keeps in arms from the destruction of his soldiers. Answer, Blasus, where have you flung aside the corpse? Even an enemy grudges not burial. When, with embraces and tears, I have sated my grief, order me also to be slain, provided only that when we have been destroyed for crime, but only because we consulted the good of the legions, we may be buried by these men around me. 
The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 23. He inflamed their excitement by weeping and smiting his breasts and face with his hands, then hurling aside those who bore him on their shoulders and impetuously flinging himself at the feet of one man after another. He roused such dismay and indignation that some of the soldiers put fetters on the gladiators, who were among the number of Blasius' slaves. Others did like the rest of his household, while a third party hurried out to look for the corpse. And had it not quickly been known that no corpse was found, and the slaves, when torturers were applied, denied the murder, and that the man never had a brother, they would have been on the point of destroying the general. As it was, they thrust out the tribunes and the camp prefect, they plundered the baggage of the fugitives, and they killed a centurion, Lucilius, to whom, with soldier's humor, they had given the name, Bring Another. Because when he had broken one vine stick on a man's back, he would call it out in a loud voice, for another and another. The rest sheltered themselves in concealment, and one was only detained, Clemens Julius, whom the soldiers considered a fit person to carry message from his ready wit. Two legions, the 8th and the 15th, were actually drawing swords against the other, the former demanding the death of a centurion, who they nicknamed Scipacurius, while the men of the 15th defended him. But the soldiers of the 9th interposed their entreaties, and when these were disregarded, their menaces. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 24. This intelligence had such an effect on Tiberius, close as he was, and most careful to hush up every serious disaster, that he dispatched his son Drusus with a leading man of the state, and with two praetorian cohorts, without any definite instructions to take suitable measures. The cohorts were strengthened beyond their usual force with some picked troops. There was, in addition, a considerable part of the Praetorian cavalry and the flower of the German soldiery, which was then the Emperor's guard. With them, too, was the commander of the Praetorians. Aulius Sinjanius, who had been associated with his own father, Strabo, had great influence with Tiberius and was to advise and direct the young prince and hold out punishment or to reward the soldiers. Drusus approached the legions as a mark of respect, met him not as usual with Glad's look of glitter and military decorations, but in unsightly scour, with faces which they thought simulated grief, rather expressed defiance. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 25. As soon as he entered the entrenchments, they secured the gates with sentries, and ordered bodies of armed men to be in readiness at certain points in the camp. The rest crowded around the general's tribunal in a dense mass. Drusus stood there, and with a gesture of his hand, demanded silence. As often as they turned their eyes back on the throng, they broke into savage exclamations. Then looking up to Drusus, they trembled. There was a confused hum, a fierce shouting, and a sudden lull. Urged by conflicting emotions, they felt panic, and they caused the like. At last, in an interval of the uproar, Drusus read his father's letter in which it was fully stated that he had a special care for the brave legions, which he had endured a number of campaigns, that as soon as his mind had recovered from its grief, he would lay their demands before the senators, that meanwhile he had sent his son to concede unhesitatingly what could be immediately granted, and that the rest must be reserved for the senate, which ought to have a voice in showing either favor or severity. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 26 the crowd replied that they had delivered their instructions to Clemens, one of the centurions, which he was to convoy to Rome. They began to speak of the soldier's discharge after sixteen years, of the rewards of completed service, of the daily pay of being a denarius, of the veterans not being detained under a standard. When Drusus pleaded an answer reference to the Senate and to his father, he is interrupted by a tumultuous shout. Why hath he come neither to increase the soldiers' pay, nor to alleviate their hardships, in a word with no power to better their lot? Yet heaven knew that all were allowed to scourge and to execute. Tiberius used formally in the name of Augustus to frustrate the wishes of the legions, and the same tricks were now being revived by Drusus. Was it only his sons who were there to visit him? Certainly. It was a new thing for the emperor to refer to the senate, merely what concerned the soldiers' interests. Was then the same senate to be consulted whenever notice was given to the execution or a battle? Were their rewards to be at discretion of absolute rulers, their punishment to be without appeal? The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 27. At last they deserted the general's tribunal, 
and to any Praetorian soldier or friend of Caesar who met them, they used those threatening gestures, which are the cause of strife and the beginning of a conflict. With special rage against Nisus Lentinus, they soon thought that he, above all others, by his age and warlike renown, encouraged Drusus, and was the first to scorn such blots on military discipline. Soon after, he was leaving with Drusus to betake himself. In foresight of this danger to the winter camp, they surrounded him, and asked him again and again whether he was going. Was it to the emperor or to the senate? They also to oppose the interests of the legions. At the same moment, they menaced him savagely, and flung stones, and now bleeding from a blow and feeling destruction certain, he was rescued by the hurried arrival of the throng which had accompanied Drusus. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 28 That terrible night which threatened an explosion of crime was tranquilized by a mere accident. Suddenly, in a clear sky, the moon's radiance seemed to die away. This the soldiers, in their ignorance of the cause, regarded as an omen of their condition, comparing the failure of her light to their own efforts, and imagining that their attempts would end prosperously should her brightness and splendor be restored to the goddess. And so they raised a din with brazen instruments and the combined notes of trumpets and horns, with joy or sorrow as she brightened or gray dark. When clouds arose and obstructed their sight, and it was thought that she was buried in the gloom, with that proudness to superstition which steals over minds once thoroughly cowed, they lamented that this portent of never-ending hardship, and that heaven frowned on their deeds. Drusus, thinking that he ought to avail himself of this change, and their temper in turn, what chances had offered to a wise account, ordered that the tents be visited. Clemens the centurion was summoned, with all others, who for their good qualities were liked by the common soldiers. These men made their way along the patrols, sentries and guards of the camp gate suggesting hope for holding out threats. How long will you besiege our emperor's son? What is it to be the end of our strifes? Will Persenius and Vablinius give pay to the soldiers and land to those who have earned disgrace and their discourage? In a word, are they, instead of the Nereus and Drusae, in control of the empire of the Roman people? Why are we not rather first in our repentance, as we are in the last in the offense? Demands made in common are granted slowly, a separate favor you may deserve and receive at the same moment. With minds affected by these words and growing mutually suspicious, they divided off new troops from the old, and one legion from another, then by degrees of instinct and obedience returned. They quitted the gates and restored to their places the standards which at the beginning of their mutiny they had grouped into one spot. Book 1, Chapter 29 At daybreak, Drusus called them to an assembly, and, though not a practiced speaker, yet with natural dignity, upbraided them for their past and commended their present behavior. He was not, he said, to be conquered by terror or by threats. Were he to see them inclining to submission and to hear the language of entreaty, he would write to his father that he might be merciful and receive the legion's petition. And their prayer, Blasius and Lucius Apronius, a Roman knight on Drusus' staff, with Justus Cantonius, a first-rank centurion, were sent again to Tiberius. Then, and ensued a conflict of opinion among them, so maintaining that it was best to wait the envoy's return, and meanwhile humor the soldiers, other that stronger measures ought to have been used, insomuch as the rabble knows no mean, and inspire fear unless they are afraid, though once they have been overawed they can be safely despised. While superstition still swayed them, the general assembly should apply terror by removing the leaders of the mutiny. Drusus's temper was inclined to harsh measures. He summoned Verblenius and Persinemius and ordered them to be put to the death. The common account is that they were buried in the general's tent, though according to some of them, their bodies were flung outside the entrenchments for all to see. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 30 Search was then made for all the chief mutineers. Some as they roamed outside the camp were cut down by the centurions or by soldiers of the praetorian cohorts. Some even the companies gave up in proof of their loyalty. The men's troubles were increased by an early winter, with continuous storms so violent that they could not go beyond their tents, or meet together to keep the standards of their places, from which they were being perpetually torn by hurricane and rain. And there still lingered the dread of the divine wrath. Nor was it without meaning, they thought, that hostile 
to an impetuous host, the stars grew dim and the storms burst over them. Their only relief from misery was to quit an ill-omened and polluted camp, and, having purged themselves of their guilt, to betake themselves again every once his winter's quarters. First the eighth, then the fifteenth legion returned. The ninth cried again and again that they ought to wait for the letter from Tiberius, but soon, finding themselves isolated by the departure of the rest, they voluntarily forestalled their inevitable fate. Drusus, without awaiting the envoy's return, as for the present, all was quiet, went back to Rome. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 31 About the same time, from the same causes, the legions of Germany rose in mutiny. With a fiery proportion to their greater numbers, and in confident hope that Germanius Caesar would not be able to endure another supremacy, and would offer himself to the legions, whose strength would carry everything before it. There were two armies on the bank of the Rhine. They named the upper army had Caesicilius for general. The lower was under the charge of Attalus Cassenia. The supreme direction rested with Germanicus, then busily employed in conducting the assessment of Gaul. The troops under the control of Silius, with minds yet in suspense, watched the issue of the mutiny elsewhere. But the soldiers of the lower army fell into a frenzy, which had its beginning in the men of the first twenty and fifth legions, and into which the first and twentieth were also drawn. For they were all quartered in the same summer camp, and the territory of the Ubai, enjoying ease or having only light duties. According on hearing of the death of Augustus, a rabble city of slaves, who had been enlisted under a recent levy at Rome, habituated to laxity and impatient of hardship, filled with ignorant minds the other soldiers, with notions that all time had come when the veteran must demand a timely discharge, the young, more liberal, pay at the end of their miseries in vengeance of the cruelty of the centurions. It was not one alone who spoke thus, as did Pernesius among the legions of Pannonia, nor was it the ears of the trembling soldiers, who looked with apprehension to other and mightier armies. But there was a sedition, and many a face and voice. The Roman world, they said, was in their hand, their victories aggrandized by the state. It was from them that emperors received their titles. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 32 Nor did their commander check them. Indeed, the blind rage of so many had robbed him of his resolution. In a sudden frenzy, they rushed with drawn swords on the centurions, their immemorial objection of the soldiers' resentment and the first cause of savage fury. They threw them to the earth and beat them sorely, sixty to one, so as to correspond with the number of centurions. Then tearing them from the ground, mangled and some lifeless, they flung them outside the entrenchments or into the river Rhine. One Septimus, who fled to the tribunal and groveling at Cassania's feet, was persistently demanded till he was given up to the destruction. Cassius Cacheria, who won for himself a memory with posterity by the murder of Caius Caesar, being then a young of high spirit, cleared a passage with his sword through the armed and opposing throng. Neither tribune nor camp prefect maintained authority any longer. Patrols, sentry, and whatever else needs of the time required were distributed by the men themselves. To those who could guess the temper of the soldiers with some penetration, the strongest symptom of a widespread and intractable commotion was the fact that, instead of being divided or instigated by a few persons, they were unanimous in their fury and equally unanimous in their composure, with so uniform a consistency that one would have thought were to be under command. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 33 Meanwhile, Germanicus, while, as I have related, he was collecting the taxes of Gaul, received news of the death of Augustus. He was married to the granddaughter of Augustus, Agrippina, who, by whom he had several children, and though he himself was the son of Drusus, brother of Tiberius, and grandson of Augusta, he was troubled by the secret hatred of his uncle and grandmother, the motives for which were the more vehemist because unjust. For the memory of Drusus was held in the honor by Roman people, and they believed that he had obtained empire. He would have restored freedom. Hence, they regarded Germanicus with favor with the same hope. He was indeed a young man of unsparing temper and with wonderful kindliness, contrasting strongly with a proud and mysterious reserve that marked the conversation and the features of Tiberius. Then there were the feminine jealousies. Livia, feeling a stepmother's bitterness towards Agrippina, and Agrippina herself being rather excitable, 
only her purity and love of her husband gave a right direction to her otherwise imperious disposition. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 34 But the nearer Germanicus was to the highest hope, the more laboriously did he exert himself for Tiberius. And he made the Niberian Sequani and all the Belgic states swear obedience to him. On hearing of the mutiny and the legions, he instantly went to the spot and met them outside the camp, eyes fixed on the ground and seemingly repentant. As soon as he entered the entrenchments, confused murmurs became audible. Some men, seizing his hand under pretense of kissing it, thrust his fingers into their mouths that he might touch their toothless gums. Others showed him their limbs bowed with age. He ordered the throng which stood near him, as it seemed promiscuous gathering, to separate itself into his military companies. They replied that they would hear better as they were. The standards were then to be advanced, so that thus the, co the cohorts might be distinguished. The soldiers obeyed reluctantly, then beginning with a reverent mention of Augustus, he passed on to the victories and triumphs of Tiberius, dwelling with a special praise on his glorious achievements with those legions in Germany. Next, he extolled the unity of Italy, the glory of Gaul, the entire absence of turbulence or strife. He was heard in silence, or with but a slight murmur. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 35 As soon as he touched on the mutiny and asked what had become of soldierly obedience, the glory of ancient disciplines, whether they had driven their tribunes and centurions, they all bared their bodies and taunted him with the scars of their wounds and the marks of the lash. And then, with confused exclamations, they spoke bitterly of the prices of exemptions, the scanty pay, of the severity of their tasks, with special mentions to the entrenchment, the fosse, the conveyance of fodder, building timber, firewood, and whatever else to be procured from necessity. Or, as a check on idleness in the camp, the fiercest clamor arose from the veteran soldiers, who, as they counted in their thirty campaigns or more, implored him to relieve worn-out men, and not let them die under the same hardships, but have an end of such harassing service, and repose without beggary. Some even claimed the legacy of the divine Augustus, with words of good omen for Germanicus, and should he wish for empire. They show themselves abundantly, willingly. Thereupon, as though he was contracting the pollution of guilt, he leapt impetuously from the tribunal. The men opposed his departure with their weapons, threatening him repeatedly he would not go back. But Germanicus, protesting that he would die rather than cast off his loyalty, plucked his sword from his side, raised it aloft, and was plunging it into his breast, when those nearest him seized his hand and held it by force. The remote and most densely crowded part of the throng, and what almost passes belief, some who came close to him urged him to strike the blow, and a soldier by the name of Claudius offered him a drawn sword, saying that it was sharper than his own. Even in their fury, this seemed to them a savage act, and one of evil precedent, and there was a pause during which Caesar's friends hurried him to his tent. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 36 There they took counsel of how to heal matters. For news was also brought that the soldiers were preparing to dispatch of envoys who were drawn the upper army into their cause, that the capital of Ubai was marked for destruction, and that the hands of the stain of plunder on them would soon be daring enough for the pillage of Gaul. The alarm was heightened by the knowledge that the enemy was aware of Roman mutiny, and would certainly attack if the Rhine bank were undefended. Yet if the auxiliary troops and allies were to be armed against the retiring legions, civil wars was in fact begun. Severity would be dangerous, profuse liberality would be scandalous, whether all or nothing were conceded to the soldierly, the state was equally in jeopardy. Accordingly, having weighed their plans one against each other, they decided that a letter should be written in the prince's name, to the effect that full discharge was granted to those who had served in twenty campaigns, and that there was a conditional re release for those who had served sixteen years and that they were to be retained under a standard, with immunity from everything except actually keeping off the enemy, that the legacies which they had asked were to be paid and doubled. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 37 The soldiers perceived that this was all invented for the occasion, and instantly pressed their demands. The discharge from service was quickly arranged by the tribunes. Payment was put off until they reached their respective winter quarters. The men of the 5th and the 21st legions refused to go in the summer camp where they stood in the money was made up out of the purses of germanicus himself and his friends and paid in full 
The 1st and 20th legions were led back by their officer Kanayan to the canton of the Ubai, marching in disgrace. Since sums of money which had been extorted from the general were carried among the eagles and the standard, Germanicus went out to the upper army, and the 2nd, the 13th, and the 16th legions without delay, accepted from him the oath of allegiance. The 14th hesitated a little, but their money and their discharge were offered even without their demanding of it. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 38 Meanwhile, there was an outbreak among the Chauncey, some by veterans of the mutinous legions on garrison duty. They were quelled for a time by the instant execution of two soldiers. Such was the order of Manias, the camp prefect, more as a salutary warning than as a legal act. Then, when the commotion increased, he fled, and having been discovered, as his hiding place was now unsafe, he borrowed resource from the audacity. It was not, he told them. The camp prefect, it was Germanicus, their general, it was Tiberius, their emperor, who they were insulting. At the same moment, overrawing all resistance, he seized the standard, faced round towards the river bank, and exclaiming that whoever left their ranks, he would hold as a deserter. He led them back into their winter quarters, disaffected indeed, but cowed. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 40 Meanwhile, envoys from the Senate had an interview with Germanicus who had now returned, at the altar of the Ubai, two legions, the first and the twentieth, with veterans discharged and serving under a standard, were there in winter quarters. In the bewilderment of terror and conscious guilt, they were penetrated by apprehension that persons had come at the Senate's orders to cancel the concessions they had extorted by mutiny. And as it was the way with a mob to fix any charge, however groundless, on some particular person, they reproach Unatius Planicus, an ex-council, and the chief envoy. With being the author of the Senate's decree, at midnight they began to demand the imperial standard kept in Germanicus's quarters, and having rushed together to the entrance, burst the door, dragged Caesar from his bed, and forced him by menaces of death to give up the standard. Then, roaming through the camp sheets, they met on the envoys, who, on hearing of the tumult, were hastened to Germanicus. They loaded him with their insults, and they were on the point of murdering them. Planicus especially, whose high rank had deterred him from the flight. In his peril, he found safety only in the camp of the First Legion. There, clasping the standard of the eagle, he sought to protect himself under their sanctity. And had not the eagle-bearer Calpurnius saved him from the worst violence, the blood of an envoy of the Roman Empire, an occurrence rare even among foes, would in a Roman camp have stained the altars of the gods. At last, with the light of day, when the general and soldiers, and the whole affair clearly recognized, Germanicus entered the camp, ordered Planicus to be conducted to him, and received him on the tribunal, and upbraided them with her fatal infatuation, received not so much by the anger of the soldiers as by that of heaven, and explained the reasons of the envoy's arrival. On the rights of the ambassadors, on the dreadful and the undeserved peril of Planicus, and also on the disgrace into the legion had brought upon itself, he dwelt with the eloquence of pity, and while the throng was confounded rather than appeased, he dismissed the envoys with an escort of auxiliary cavalry. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 40 Amid the alarm, all condemned Germanicus for not going to the upper army, where he might find obedience and help against the rebels. Enough and more than enough blunders, they said. Had they been made granting discharges and money indeed by conciliatory means, even if Germanicus held his own life cheap, why should he keep a little son and pregnant wife among madmen who outraged every human right? Let these, at least, be restored safely in their branchire and to the state. When his wife spurned by the notion, protesting that she was a descendant of the divine Augustus and could face peril with no degenerate spirit, he at last embraced her and the son of their love with many tears, and after long delay compelled her to depart. Slowly moved along a pitiful process of woman, a general's fugitive wife and a little son in her bosom, her friend's wives weeping round her. With her, they were dragging themselves from the camp. Not less sorrowful were those who remained. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 41 There was no appearance of the triumphant general about Germanicus, and he seemed to be in the conquered city rather than in his own camp. While groans and wailings attracted the ears and looks even of the soldiers, they came out of their tents asking, What was that mournful sound? What meant that sad sight? Here were ladies of rank, not a centurion to escort them, not a soldier, no signs of a prince's wife, none of the usual women. 
Could they be going to the Trevari to be subjects of the foreigner? Then they felt shame and pity and remembered his father Agrippa, her grandfather Augustus, her father-in-law Drustus, her own glory as a mother of children, her noble purity. And there was in her little child too, born in the camp, brought up amid the tents of the legion, whom they used to call in soldiers' fashion, Caligia, because he often wore the shoe so called, to win the men's good will. But nothing moved them so much as jealousy for Trevari. They entreated, stopped on their way, that Agrakina may return and remain, some running to meet her, while most of them went back to Germanicus, he, with grief and anger, that they were yet fresh, thus began to address the throng around him. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 42 Neither wife nor son are dearer to me than my father in the state, but he will surely have the protection of his own majesty, the empire of Rome, that of our own armies, my wife and children, whom, or in question of your glory, I would willingly expose to destruction. Now I remove to any distance of your fury, so that whatever wickedness is thereby threatened may be expediated by my blood only, and that you may not be more guilty by the slaughter of a great-grandson of Augustus, and that the murder of the daughter-in-law of Tiberius. For what have you not dared? What have you not profaned during these days? What name shall I give to this gathering? Am I to call you soldiers? You have been beset with entrenchments in your arms of your general son, or citizens, when you have trampled underfoot the authority of the Senate. Even the rights of public enemies, the sacred characters of the ambassador, the laws of nations have been violated by you. The divine Julius once quelled an Arpitae's mutiny with a single word, by calling those who were announcing their military's obedient citizens. The divine Augustus cowed the legions who had fought Actum with one look on his face. Though I am not yet what they were, still I am descended from them. It would be strange and unworthy thing, if should I be spurned by the sordiety of Spain or Syria. First with the twentieth legions, you who have received your standards from Tiberius, you men of the twentieth, who have shared with me so many battles, and have been enriched with so many rewards. Is not this fine gratitude with you, or repaying for your general? Are these the tidings which I shall have to carry to my father, when he hears only joyful other provinces, that his own recruits, his own veterans, are not satisfied with discharge or pay, that here only centurions are murdered, tribunes driven away, and envoys imprisoned, camps and rivers stained with blood, while I am myself dragging on a, a precarious existence amongst men who hate me? The Annals, Chapter 43 why, on the first day of our meeting, why did you, my friends, wrest from me in your blindness the steel which I was preparing to plunge into my own breast? Better and more loving was the act of the man who offered me the sword. At any rate, I should have perished before I was yet conscious of all the disgraces of my army. While you would have chosen a general who thought he might allow my death to pass unpunished, would avenge the death of Arius and his three legions. Never indeed may heaven suffer the Bellage, though they proffer their aid to have the glory and honor of having rescued the name of Rome and quelled the tribes of Germany. This is thy spirit, divine Augustus, now received into Helen, thine image, Father Drusus, and the remembrance of thee, which, with the same soldiers who are now stimulated by shame and ambition, should wipe out this blot and turn the wrath of civil strife to the destruction of the foe. You too, in whose faces and in whose hearts I perceive a change. If only you restore the Senate and their envoys to the Emperor his due allegiances. To myself, my wife, and my son, do you stand aloof from pollution and separate the mutinous amongst you? This will be a pledge of your repentance, a guarantee of your loyalty. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 44 Thereupon, as the plaints confessing that his reproaches were true, they implored him to punish the guilty, pardon those who had erred, and led them against the enemy. And he was to recall his wife, to let the nurslings of the legions return, and not to be handed over as hostage to the Gauls. As to Agrippina's return, he made the excuse of her approaching confinement, and of winter. His son, he said, would come, and the rest they might settle themselves. Away they hurried, hither and thither, altered men, and dragged the chief mutineers in change to Cassius Coltrananius commander of the first legion, who tried and punished them one by one in following fashion. In front of the throng stood the legions with drawn sword. Each accused man was on a raised platform and was pointed out by a tribune. If they shouted out that he was guilty, he was thrown headlong and cut into pieces. 
the soldiers gloated over the bloodshed, as though it gave them absolution. Nor did Caesar check them, seeing without, without any order from himself, the same men were responsible for all the cruelty and the odium of the deed. The example was followed by the veterans, who were soon afterwards sent to Ratea, nominally to defend the province against the threatened invasions by the Servai, but really as to think they might tear themselves from a camp stamped with a horror and dreadful remedy, no less with a memory of guilt. Then the general revised the list of centurions. Each at his summons stated his name, his rank, his birthplace, the number of his campaigns, what brave deeds he had done in battle, his military rewards, if any. If the tribunes and legion commanded his energy and good behavior, he retained his rank. While they unanimously charged him with rapacity or of cruelty, he was dismissed the service. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 45 Quiet being thus restored for the present, a no less formidable difficulty remained, through the turbulence of the 5th and the 21st legions, who were in winter quarters 60 miles away at Old Camp, as the place was called. These, in fact, had been the first to begin the mutiny, and the most atrocious deeds had been committed by their hands. Unweighed by the punishment of their comrades, and unmoved by their condition, they still retained their resentment. Caesar accordingly proposed and sent an armed fleet with some of their allies down the Rhine, resolved to make war on them, should they reject his authority. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 46 At Rome, meanwhile, when the first results of the affairs in Illyrium was not yet well known, the men had heard of the commotion among the German legions. The citizens in alarm reproached Tiberius for the hypocritical irresolution with which he was befooling the Senate and the people, feeble and disarmed as they were while the soldiery were all the time in revolt, and could not be quelled by the yet imperfectly matured authority of the two striplings. He ought to have gone himself and confronted with his imperial majesty, those who would have thought and soon yielded. When once they saw a sovereign of long experience, who was one the supreme dispenser of rigor and bounty, could Augustus, with the feebleness of age on him, so visit Germany? And is Tiberius, in the vigor of life, to sit in the Senate and criticize its members' words? He had taken good care that there should be slavery at Rome. He should now apply some soothing medicine to the spirit of soldiers, that they might be willing to endure peace. The Annals Book 1, Chapter 47 Notwithstanding these remonstrances, it was the inflexible purpose of Tiberius not to quit the headquarters of the empire, or to imperil himself in the state. Indeed, many conflicting thoughts troubled him. The army in Germany was the stronger, that in the Pannonia was nearer, the first was supported by all the strength of Gaul, the latter menaced Italy. Which was he to prefer, without the fear that those whom he had slighted would be infuriated by the affront? But his sons might alike visit both, and not compromise the imperial dignity which inspired the greatest awe into the distance. There was also an excuse for mere use referring to some matters to their father, with the possibility that he could conciliate or crush those who risked Germanius or Drusus, what resources remained if they despised the emperor. However, as if on the eve of the departure, he selected his attendants, provided his camp equipage, and prepared a fleet. Then winter and matters of business were the various pretexts with which he amused, first sensible men, then the populace, last and longest of all, the provinces. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 48 Germanicus, meantime, thought he had concentrated his army, and prevailed vengeance against the mutineers, though that he still thought he allowed them an interval, in case they might, with a late summer before them, regard their safety. He sent a dispatch to Cassania, which said that he was on his way with a strong force, and that unless they forestalled his arrival by the execution of the guilty, he would resort to an indiscriminate massacre. Cassania read the letter, confidentially, to the eagle and standard bearers, and to all in the camp who were the least tainted by disloyalty, and urged them to save the whole army from disgrace, and themselves from destruction. And peace, he said, the merits of a man's cause are carefully weighted, and when war bursts on us, innocent and guilty alike perish. Upon this they sounded those whom they thought best for their purpose, and when they saw that the majority of their legions remained loyal, the commander's suggestion fixed a time for falling with a sword on all the vilest and foremost of the mutineers, then, at a mutually given signal, they rushed into tents and butchered the unsuspecting men, none but those in the secret knowing of what was the beginning or what was the end of the slaughter. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 49 
The scene was in contrast to all civil wars which have ever occurred. It was not in battle. It was not from opposing camps. It was from those same dwellings, where day say them at the same common meals, night resting from labor, that they divided themselves into two factions, and they showered upon each other their missiles. Uproar, wounds, bloodshed were everywhere visible. The cause was a mystery. All else was a disposal of chance. Even some loyal men were slain, for, on his being once understood who they were the objects of fury, some of the worst mutineers had seized on weapons. Neither commander nor tribune was present to control them. The men were allowed license and vengeance to their heart's content. Soon afterwards, Germanicus entered the camp, and exclaimed with a flood of tears that this was destruction rather than remedy, and ordered the bodies to be burnt. Even then, their savage spirit seized with a desire to march against the enemy as an atonement for their frenzy, and that it was felt the shades of their fellow soldiers could be appeased only by exposing such impious breasts to honorable scars. Caesar followed the enthusiasm of the men, and having bridged the Rhine, he sent across 12,000 from the legions, with six and twenty alike cohorts, and eight squadrons of cavalry, whose discipline had been without a stain during the mutiny. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 50 there was exultation among the Germans, not far off as long as they were detained by the public mourning for the loss of Augustus, and then by our dissensions. But the Roman general and a forced march cut through the Caesian forest and the barrier which had been begun in the Tiberius, and pitched his camp on this barrier. In front and rear being defended by entrenchments, his flank by timber barricades. He then penetrated some forest passes, but little known. And there were two routes, and he deliberated whether he should take the longer route or the shorter route. The longer route, which was much more difficult and unexplored, and consequently unguarded by the enemy. He chose the longer way and hurried on every remaining preparation for his scouts had brought the word that the Germans, it was a night of festivity, with games and one of their grand banquets. Cassinia had orders to advance with some light cohorts and to clear away any obstructions from the woods. The legions followed at a moderate interval. They were helped by a night of bright starlight, reached the village of the Marseilles and threw their pickets round the enemy, who even then were stretched on their beds or at their tables, without the least fear or any sentries before their camp. So complete was their carelessness and disorder of at war indeed that there was no apprehension. Peace it was certainly not, merely languid and heedless ease of half-intoxicated people. Caesar, to spread devastation more widely, divided his eager legions into four columns and ravaged a space of fifty miles with fire and sword. Neither sex nor age moved his compassion. Everything, sacred or profane, the Temple Two of Tafama, as they called it, the special resort of all those tribes, was leveled to the ground. But there was not a wound among our soldiers, who cut down half asleep or a strangling foe. The Buruchadi, Tubinates, and Upsadis were roused by the slaughter, and they beset the forest passes along which the army had to return. The general knew this, and he marched, prepared both to advance and fight. Part of the cavalry and some of the auxiliary cohorts led the van. Then came the first legion. With the baggage in the center, the men of the 21st closed up the left, those in the 5th, the right flank, the 20th legion secured the rear, and the next were the rest of the allies. Meanwhile, the enemy moved not until the army began to defile the column through the woods, then made slight skirmishing attacks on its flanks. And with this, the whole force changed to the rear. The light cohorts were thrown into confusion by the dense masses of the Germans, when Caesar rode up to the men of the 20th Legion, and in a loud voice exclaimed that this was the first time for wiping out of the immunity. Advance, he said, and hasten to turn your guilt into glory. This fired their courage, and in a single dash they broke through the enemy and drove him back with a great slaughter in an open country. At the same moment, the troops of the van emerged from the woods and entrenched a camp. After this, their march was uninterrupted, and soldierly and the confidence of recent successes and forgetful of the past were placed in winter quarters. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 52 The news was a source of joy and also of anxiety to Tiberius. He rejoiced that the mutiny was crushed, but the fact that Germanicus had won the soldiers' favor by lavishing money and promptly granting discharge as well as his fame as a soldier, annoyed him. Still, he brought his achievements under the notice of the Senate, and spoke much of his greatness in language elaborated for effect, more so than he could believe in his innermost heart. He bestowed a briefer praise on Drusus, and on the termination of the disturbance in Ilcarium, 
but he was most earnest in his speech for more hearty, and he confirmed it too, and the armies of Pannonia and the concessions of Germanicus. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 53 That same year, Julia ended her days. For the profligacy that she had formerly been confined by her father, Augustus, in the island of Pandita, and then in the town of Regani, on the shores of the Straits of Sicily, she had been the wife of Tiberius when Cassius and Lucius Caesar were in their glory, and had disdained him an unequal match. This was Tiberius's special reasoning for retiring to Rhodes. When he obtained the empire, he left her in banishment and disgrace, deprived of all hope after the murder of Pompus Agrippa, and let her perish, a lingering death of destitution, with the idea that obscurity would hang over her from the length of her exile. He had a like motive for cruel vengeance on the Seprumus Gracchus, a man of a noble family and of shrewd understanding and perverse eloquence, who had seduced the same Julia when she was the wife of Marcia Agrippa, and this was not the end of the intrigue. When she had been handed over to Tiberius, her persistent paramour inflamed with her but disobedience hatred toward her husband. And a letter which Julia wrote to her father Augustus, invading against Tiberius, was supposed to be the composition of Gracchus. He was accordingly banished to Circinia, where he endured an exile of fourteen years. Then the soldiers who were then sent to slay him found him on proximity. Expecting no good on their arrival, he begged a brief interval, in which they gave letter by his last instruction to his wife, Alauria and then offered his neck to the executioners, dying with courage not unworthy of a Seprosanium name, which his degenerate life had dishonored. Some had related that these soldiers were not sent from Rome, but by Lucius of Sprenia, proconsul of Africa, on the authority of Tiberius, who had vainly hoped that the infamy of the murder might be shifted onto Asprenius. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 54 same year witnessed the establishment of the religious ceremonies in the new priesthood of brotherhood and Augustales. Just as in former days, Titus Tatticus, to retain the rights of Sabines, had instituted the Titan Brotherhood. Twenty-one were chosen by lot from the chief men of the state. Tiberius, Drusus, Claudius, and Germanicus were added to their number. The Augustial Games, which were then inaugurated, were distributed by quarrels arising out of the rivalry between the actors. Augustus had shown indolence and the entertainment as a way of humoring Machianus' extravagant passions for Bathyllus. Nor did he himself dislike such amusement, and he thought it citizen-like to mingle in the pleasures of the populace, very different from the tendency of Tiberius' character. But a people so many years indolently treated, he did not venture to put under harsher control. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 55 in the consulship of Drusus Caesar and Caesus Nobranus, Germanicus had a triumph to greet him. The war still lasted, and though it was for the summer campaign that he was most vigorously preparing, he anticipated it by a sudden inroad of the Cati in the beginning of spring. There had, in fact, sprung up a hope of the enemy being divided between Arminius and Segestes, famously respectively for respectively for treachery and loyalty towards us. Arminius was the last disturber of Germany. Suggestities often revealed that the fact that a rebellion was being organized, more especially at that last banquet after which they had rushed to arms, and he urged Varius to arrest himself and the Arminius and all the other chiefs, assuring him that the other people would attempt nothing if the leading men were removed, and that he would have then an opportunity of shifting accusations and distinguishing the innocent. But Varius fell by fate and by sword of the Arminius, by whom Suggestes, through dragged into war by the unanimous voice of a nation, continued to be at feud, his resentment being heightened by his personal motives, as Arminius had carried off his daughter, who was betrothed to another. With the son-in-law detested, and father's-in-law also at enmity, what are the bounds of love between united hearts became bitter foes, with incentives to fury. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 56 Germanicus accordingly gave Cassian four legions, 5,000 auxiliaries with some hastily raised levies from the Germans, dwelling on the bank of the Rhine. He was himself at the head of an equal number of legions, and twice as many allies. Having established a fort on the side of his father's entrenchment on Mount Taunus, he hurried his troops in a quickly marching order against the Hakadi, leading Lucius Apronius to direct works connected with the roads and the bridges. With a dry season and comparatively shallow streams, a rare circumstance in that climate, accomplished without obstruction a rapid march, and he feared for his return, heavy rains and swollen rivers. But so suddenly did he come onto the Chati, all the helplessness from age or sex were once captured or slaughtered. 
Their able-bodied men had swum across the river to Adrina, trying to keep back the Romans as they were commencing a bridge. Subsequently, they were driven back by missiles and arrows, and having in vain attempted negotiations for peace, some took refuge with Germanicus, while the rest, leaving their cantons and villages, dispersed themselves and their forests. After burning Matium, the capital of the tribe, and ravaging the open country, Germanicus marched back towards the Rhine, the enemy not daring as to harass the rear of the retiring army, which was his usual practice whenever he fell back by the way of stratagem rather than from panic. It had been the intention of Cherusi the Helchati, but Cassina thoroughly cowed them, carrying his arms everywhere, and the Marci who ventured to engage him, he repulsed in a successful battle. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 57 Not long after envoys came from Zegestes, imploring aid against the violence of his fellow countrymen, by whom he was hemmed in, and with whom Arminius had greater influence, because he consulted a war. For with barbarians, the more eager a man's daring, the more does he inspire confidence, and the more highly he is esteemed in the times of revolution. With the envoys of Segestes, he had associated his son by the name of Segamundus, but the youth hung back for a bit from the consciousness of guilt. For in the year of the revolt of Germany, he had been appointed a priest at the altar of the Ubai, and had rent the sacred garlands and fled from the rebels. Induced, however, to hope the mercy from Rome, he brought his father's message. He was graciously received and sent with an escort to the Gallic bank of the Rhine. It was now worthwhile for Germanicus to march back his army. A battle was fought against the besiegers, and Segestes was rescued with a numerous band of kinsfolk and dependents. In the number were some women of rank, among them a wife of Arminius, who was the daughter of Segestes, but who exhibited the spirit of her husband rather than her father, subdued neither to tears nor to tones of suppliant, was tightly clasped within her bosom, and her eyes which dwelt on the hope of her offspring. The spoils also taken to the defeat of Varus were brought in, having been given as plunder to many of those who were then being surrendered. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 58 Sergestes too was there in person, a stately figure, fearless in remembrance of having been a faithful ally. His speech was to this effect. It is not my first day of the steadfast loyalty of the Roman people. For the time that the divine Augustus gave me citizenship, I have chosen my friends and foes with an eye to your advantage, not from hatred of my fatherland, for traitors are detested even by those who them they prefer, but because I held the Romans and Germans that I have the same interests, and that peace is better than war, and therefore I denounce Varius, who then commanded your army. Arminius, the ravisher of my daughter, and the violator of your treaty, I was put off by that dilatory general, and, as I found but little protection in the laws, I urged him to arrest myself, and Arminius, and his accomplices. That night is my witness. Would that it had been my last, what followed may deplored rather than offended. However, I threw Arminius into chains, and I endured to have them put on myself by his partitions, and as soon as you would give me opportunity, I show my preference for the old over new, for peace over commotion, not to get a reward, but that I might clear myself from treachery, and be at the same time a fit mediator for the German people, should they choose repentance rather than ruin. For the youth and heir of my son, I entreat forgiveness. As for my daughter, I admit that it is by compulsion that she has been brought here. It will be for you to consider which fact weighs most on you, that she is with a child by Arminius, or that she owes me being with her. Caesar, in gracious reply, promised safety to his children and kinfolk, and a home for himself in the old province. He then led back the army and received the proposal of Tiberius, the title of imperator. The wife of Arminius gave birth to a male child. The boy, who was brought up at Ravenna, soon afterwards suffered insult, which at a proper time I shall relate. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 59 the report of the surrender and kind reception of Segestes, when generally known, was heard with hope and grief according as men shrank from war or desired it. Arminius, with his naturally furious temper, was driven to frenzy by the seizure of his wife and the foredooming to slavery of his wife's unborn child. He fled hither and thither among Caressi, demanding war against Segestes, war against Caesar, and he refrained not from taunts. Nobler the father, he would say, mighty the general, brave the army which with such strength has carried off one weak woman. Before me three legions, three commanders have fallen, not by treachery, not against pregnant women, but openly against our men do I wage war. 
They are still to be seen by the groves of Germany and Roman standards, which I hung up our country's gods. Let Segestes dwell on the conquered bank. Let him restore his son to his priestly office. One thing there is which Germans will never do thoroughly excuse. They are having seen between Elbe and Rhine the Roman roads, Axis and Toga. Other nations, in their ignorance of Roman rule, have no experience of punishments, know nothing of tributes, and as well have shaken them off. But the great Augustus, ranked among deities, and his chosen heir Tiberius, departed from us, baffled. Let us not quail before an inexperienced stripling, before a mutinous army. If you prefer your fatherland, your ancestors, your ancient life, to tyrants and new colonies, follow your leader, Arminius, to glory and freedom, rather than suggesties to ignominious servitude. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 60 this language roused not only by the Carossi but the neighboring tribes, and drew to their side Egoniums, the uncle of Arminius, who had long been respected by the Romans. This increased Caesar's alarm. That the war might not burst in all his fury in one point, he sent Cassinia through Brutare, through the river Osmita, with forty Roman cohorts to distract the enemy, while the cavalry was led by its commander Pedo in the territories of Frisi. Germanicus put himself four legions on shipboard and conveyed them through the lakes, and the infantry, cavalry, and fleet met simultaneously at the river already mentioned. The Chauncey on promising aid were associated with us in military fellowship. Lucius Servenius was dispatched by Germanicus on a flying column and routed it to Brucarsi as they were burning their possessions, and amid the carnage and plunder found the eagle of the 19th legion, which had been lost to Varus. The troops which were then marched to the furthest frontier of Brutari, and all the country between the rivers Osmati and Lupita were ravaged. Not far from the forest of Torbagodium, where the remains of Varius and his legions were said to lie unburied. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 61 Germanicus upon this was sieged with an eager longing to pay the last honor to the soldiers and their general, while the whole army present moved to compassion by the thought of their kinsfolk and friends, moved to compassion by the thought of their kinsfolk and friends, and indeed of the calamities of war and the lot of mankind, having sent on Cassenia to advance through the reconnoitre of the obscure forest passes and to rage bridges and causeways over the watery swamps and treacherous plains, they visited the mournful scene and their horrible sights of associations. Varius's camp, with its wide circumference and the measurement of its central space, clearly indicated the handiwork of three legions. Further on, the particularly fallen rampart and the shadow foes suggest the inference that it was a shattered remnant of the army which there had taken upon a position. In the center of the field were their whitening bones of med, as they had fled or stood their ground, strewn everywhere and piled in heaps. Near lay fragments of weapons and limbs of horses, and also human heads, prominently nailed to trees of trunks. In the adjacent groves were the barbarous altars, on which they had immortally tribunes the first rank centurions. Some survivors of the disaster who had escaped from the battle of its capacity described how this was the spot where the, the ill-starred hand he had found himself death. They pointed out the raised ground from which Arminius had harangued his army, the number of giblets and the capaves, the pits for the living, and how in his exhaustion he had insulted the standards and eagles. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 62 And so the Roman army, now on spot six years after the disaster and grief and anger, began to bury the bones of the three legions. Not a soldier knowing whether he was interfering the relics of a relative or a stranger, but looking on as all kinsfolk and their own blood. While the wrath rose higher than ever against a foe, in raising the barrow, Caesar laid the first sod, rendering thus a most welcome honor to the dead, and sharing almost in sorrow of those present. This Tiberius did not approve, either interpreting unfavorably every act of Germanicus, or because he thought that the spectacle of the slain and buried made the army slow to fight and more afraid of the enemy. And that a general, invested with the Agurit and its very ancient ceremonies, ought not have polluted himself with funeral rites. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 63 Germanicus, however, pursued Arminius, and he fell back into the tactless wilds, and as soon as he had the opportunity, he ordered his cavalry to sally forth and scour the plains occupied by the enemy. Arminius, having bidden his men to concentrate themselves and keep close in the woods, suddenly wheeled around, and soon gave those whom he had concealed in the forest passes the signal to rush to attack. Thereupon, our cavalry was thrown into disorder by this new force, and some cohorts 
in reserve were sent, which, broken by the shock of flying troops, increased the panic. They were being pushed into a swamp, known for the victorious assailants, perilous to men unacquainted with it. When Caesar led his legions forth into the battle array, they struck terror into the enemy and gave confidence to our men, and they separated without advantage to either. Soon afterwards, Germanicus led his army back to the Amisa, taking his legions by the fleet as he had brought them up. Part of the cavalry was ordered to make for the Rhine along the sea coast. Cassina, who commanded a division of his own, was advised, though he was returning by a route he knew, to a pass of long bridges, with all possible speed. This was a narrow road amidst vast swamps, which had formerly been constructed by Lucius Dominatus. On every side were quagmires of thick, clinging mud, or perilous with streams. Around were woods of gradual slope, which Arminius now completely occupied. As soon by a short route and quick march, he had outstripped troops heavily laden with baggage and arms. At Cassina was doubt that he could possibly replace bridges, which were ruinous from age, and at the same time hold back the enemy. He resolved to encamp on the spot, and that some might begin the repair, and others the attack. The Annals Book 1, Chapter 64 The barbarians attempted to break through the outposts and throw themselves on the engineering parties, which they harassed, pacing them around and continually charging them. There was confused din for the men at work and the combatants. Everything alike was unfavorable to the Romans. The place was deep in swamps, insecure to the food, and slippery at once and burdened with the coats of mail, the impossibility of aiming the javelins amid the water. The Chersori, on the other hand, were familiar in fighting in fens, and they had huge frames and lances long enough to inflict wounds even at a distance. Night at last released the regions, which were now wavering from a disastrous engagement. The Germans, whose success rendered unwearied without even the taking of any rest, turned all the streams which rose from the slopes surrounding hills into the lands beneath the grounds being thus flooded, and the completed portion of our work submerged, and our soldiers' work doubled. This was Cassinius' fortieth campaign as a subordinate or a commander, and, with such experience of success and peril, he was perfectly fearless. As he thought over future possibilities, he could devise no plan but to keep the enemy within the woods, till the wounded and the more cumbered troops were to advance, for between the hills and the swamps there stretched a plain which would admit an extended line. The legions had their assigned places, the fifth on the right wing, the twentieth on the left. The men are the first to lead the van, the twentieth to repel pursuers. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 65 It was a restless night for different reasons, the barbarians and their festivity filling the valleys under the hills and the echoing glens with merry song or sh savage shouts. While the Roman camp were flickering fires, broken exclamations, and men lay scattered along the entrenchments, or wandered from tent to tent, wakeful rather than watchful. A ghastly dream appalled the general. He seemed to see Quintilius Varius, covered in blood, rising out of the swamps, and to hear him, as if it were, calling to him, but he did not, as he had managed to obey the call. He even repelled his hand as he stretched over to him. At daybreak, the legions posted on the wings from panic or perversity, deserted in their position and hastily occupied a plain beyond the morass. Yet Arminius, free to attack, did not at the moment rush out on them. But when the barrage was closed in the mud and the foes, the soldiers around it, and in disorder, the array of the standards in confusion, every one in selfish haste and all ears deaf to the word of command, he ordered the Germans to charge, exclaiming again, Behold the warriors and legions once entangled in Varius' fate. As he spoke, he cut through a column with some pickled men, inflicting wounds chiefly on the horses, staggering in their blood in the slippery marsh. They took off the riders, driving hither and thither all their way, and trampling on the fallen. The struggle was the hottest round the eagles, which could neither be buried from the face of the storm of missiles, nor planted in the misery soil. Cassina, while he was keeping the battle, fell from his horse, which was pierced under him, and was being hemmed in. When the first legion threw itself in the way, the greed of the foe helped him, for they left the slaughter to secure the spoil. The legions, towards evening, struggled on to open and firm ground. Nor did this end their miseries. Entrenchments had to be thrown up, materials sought for earthworks. While the army had lost a great extent of their implements for digging earth and cutting turf, there were no tents for the rank and file, no comforts for the wounded. As they shared their food, soiled by mire and blood, they bewailed the darkness as this awful omen, and the one day yet remained so many thousand men. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 66 
It chanced that a horse which had broken its halter and had wandered wildly in fright at the uproar overthrew some men against whom it dashed. Thence arose such a panic from the belief that the Germans had burst into the camp that all rushed to the gates. Of all these, Dickman Gate was the point chiefly sought, as it was the furthest from the enemy, and safer for flight. Cassinia, having ascertained that the alarm was groundless, yet being unable to stop or save the soldiers, by authority or treaties, or even by force, threw himself to the earth and the gateway. And at last, by an appeal to their pity, as though he would have to pass the body of a commander, closed the way. At the same moment, the tribunes of the centurions convinced them that it was a false alarm. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 67 Having then assembled them at his headquarters and ordered them to hear his words in silence, he reminded them of the urgency of the crisis. Their safety, he said, lay in their arms, which they must, however, use discretion, and they must remain within the entrenchments till the enemy approached closer. In the hope of storming them, then, there must be a general sortie, and that the sortie of the Rhine must be reached, whereas they fled, the more forests, deeper in swamps, with a savage foe awaited them. But if they were victorious, glory and renown would be theirs. He dwelt on them that it was all dear to them at home, all that testified to their honor in the camp without any more allusion to disaster. Next he handed over the horses, beginning with his own, of the officers and the tribunes to the bravest fighters in the army, quite impartially, to that these first and then to the infantry might charge the enemy. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 68 There was much restlessness in the German host, with his hopes, its eagers, longing, and the conflicting opinions of its chiefs. Arminius advised that they should allow the Romans to quit their position, and, when they had quitted it, again by surprise them in a swamping and intricate ground. Arius, with fiercer counsels heartily welcomed to the barbarians, was for the beleaguering the entrenchment of an armed array. So as to storm them, he would, he'd say, be easy, and there would be more prisoners for the booty unspoiled. So at the daybreak they trampled to the foses, flung hurdles into them, seized the upper part of the breastwork where the troops were thinly distributed and seemingly paralyzed by fear. When they were fairly within the fortifications, the signal was given to the cohorts, and the horns and trumpets sounded. Instantly, with a loud and sudden rush, our men threw themselves to the German rear. With taunts here, there were no woods nor swamps, but they were on equal ground. With equal chance, the sound of trumpets, the glean of arms, which were to be so expected, burst over to the greater effect of the enemy. Thinking only as if they were the easy destruction of only a few half-armed men, they were struck down as unprepared for his verse that they had been elated by success. Arminius and Igorminius fled the battle, and the first unhurt, the second severely wounded. Their followers were slaughtered. As long as our fury, the light of day lasted. It was not till night that the legions returned. And though more wounds the same want of provisions distressed them, yet they found strength, healing, sustenance, everything indeed in their victory. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 69 Meanwhile, a rumor had spread that our army was cut off, and that the furious German host was marching on Gaul, and had not been an Agrippian prevented of the bridge over the Rhine from being destroyed. Some of their cowardice would have dared that base act, a woman of heroic spirit, she assumed during those days the duties of the general, and distributed clothes and medicine among the soldiers, as they were destitute or wounded. According to the Caius Plinius, the historian of the German wars, she stood at the extremity of the bridge, and bestowed praise and thanks on the restoring legions. This made a deep impression on the mind of Tiberius. Such zeal, he thought, could not be guileless. It was not against a foreign foe. She was thus courting the soldiers. Generals had nothing left with them when a woman went amongst her companies, attended the standard, ventured on bribery as though it showed the slight ambition to parade her son in a commander soldier's uniform, and wished him to be called Caesar Caligula. Acarpina had now more power with the armies than officers, than generals. A woman had quelled mutiny which the sovereign's name could not check. All this was inflamed and aggravated by Sejanus, who, with his thorough comprehension of the character of Tiberius, sowed for a distant future hatred for the emperor, might treasure up and might exhibit when fully matured. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 70 Of the legions which he had conveyed by ship, Germanicus gave the second and fourteenth to Publius Vitellius, to be marched by land so that his fleet might sail more easily over the sea full of shoals, or to take the ground more lightly at the ebb tide. Vitellius first pursued this route without interruption having a dry shore or the waves coming in gently. After a while, through the force of the north wind, the equinoctial season, the swells in the highest, his army was driven and tossed hither and thither. The country, too, was flooded. 
Sea, shore, fields presented in one aspect, nor could be treacherous quicksand be distinguished from soil ground or shallows from this deep water. Men were swept away in the waves or sucked under by the eddies. Beasts of burden, baggage, lifeless bodies floated out and blocked their way. The companies were mingled in confusion, now with a breast, now with a head only above water, sometimes losing their footing, and parted by the comrades or drowned. The voice of mutual encouragement availed not against the adverse foes of the waters. There was nothing to distinguish the brave from the coward, the prudent from the careless. Forethought from chance, the same strong power swept everything before it. At last, Vitellius struggled out on a higher ground and led his men up to it. There they passed the night, without necessary food, without fire, many of them with bare or bruised limbs, and a plight as pitiable as the men besieged by an enemy. For such at last to have the opportunity of glorious death, while heroes of destruction without honor, daylight restored land to their sight, and they pushed their way to the river Visidius, where Caesar had arrived with the fleet. The legions then embarked, while rumor was flying about that they were drowned. Nor was there a belief at their safety, till they saw Caesar and the army return. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 71 By this time, Straternius, who had been dispatched to receive or surrender Sigumenius, brother of Sagesites, had conducted the chief, together with his son, to the canon of the Ubai. Both were pardoned. Sagumenius readily, the son with some hesitation, because it was said that he had insulted the corpse of Quintilius Varius. Meanwhile, Gaul, Spain, and Italy vied in repairing the losses of the army, offering whatever they had at hand, arms, horses, gold. Germanicus, having praised their zeal, took only for the wars and the arms and horses, and relieved the soldiers out of his own purse, and that he might also soften the remembrance of this disaster by kindness. He went round the wounded, applauded their feats of a soldier after soldier, examined their wounds, raised hopes of one, the ambition of another, and the spirits of all by his encouragement and interest, thus strengthening their ardor for himself and for battle. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 72 that year, triumphal honors were decreed to Alus, Sassiana, Lucius, Apronius, Callus, Silius for their achievements. Under Germanicus, the title of father of his country, which the people had so often thrust on him, Tiberius refused, nor would he allow obedience to be sworn to his enactments, though the Senate voted it, for he said repeatedly that all human things were uncertain, and that the more he obtained, the more precarious his position was. But he did not thereby create a belief of patriotism, for he revived the law with treason, the name of which was indeed known in ancient times, though other matters came under its jurisdiction, such as the betrayal of an army, or seditious stirring of people, or in short, any corrupt act by which this man has impaired. The majesty of the people of Rome, deeds were only liable to accusation. Words went unpunished. It was Augustus, who first under color of his law, applied legal inquiry to the libellious writings, provoked he had been by the licentious freedom for which Cassius Severius had defamed men and women of distinction and insulting satires. Soon afterwards, Tiberius, when consulted with Palmius Masser, the praetor, to whether persecutions for treason should be revived, replied that laws must be enforced. He, too, had been exasperated by the publication of verses uncertain authorship pointed at his cruelty, his arrogance, and his dissensions with his mother. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 73 It will not be uninteresting if I relate the cases of Falinus and Rubiaris, Roman knights to moderate fortune, the first experiments at such accusations, in order to explain the origin of a most terrible scourge, how by Tiberius's cunning it kept amongst us, how subsequently it was checked, finally how it burst into flame and consumed everything. Against Falinius it was alleged by his accuser that he had admitted amongst the vorities of Augustus, who and every great house were associated into a kind of brotherhood, one Cassinus, a buffoon of an infamous life, and that he had also in selling his gardens included the state a statue of Augustus, against Rubirius the charge that he had violated the perjury of the divinity of Augustus. With this then known to Tiberius, he wrote to the consuls that his father had not had a place in Tevin to creed to him, that the honor might be turned to the destruction of the citizens. Cassius, the actor with the men of the same profession, used to take part in the games which had been concentrated by his mother or in the memory of Augustus. Nor was it contrary to the religion of the state of the emperor's image, like those of the other deities, to be added with sale of gardens or houses. Just as the oath, the thing ought to be considered as the man had deceived Jupiter. Wrongs done to the gods were the gods' concerns. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 74 not long afterwards, Grenius Macelius, proconsul of Bithynia, was accused of treason by his casator Caspinio Carpinius, and the charge was supported by Romensis Hisponia. 
Crispinius then entered a line of life, afterwards rendered notorious by the miseries of age of men shamelessnesses. Needlessly obscure and restless, he wormed himself into his stealthy informations and the confidence of a vindictive prince, and soon imperiled all the most distinguished citizens, and having thus gained influence with one, hatred from all besides, he left an example in following which beggars became wealthy, this insignificant, formidable, and brought ruin first on others, and finally on themselves. He alleged against Marsilius that he had made some disrespectful marks about Tiberius, a change not to be faded, insomuch as the accusers selected the worst feature of the emperor's character and grounded his case on them. The things were true, as so were believed, and so it to be said. Hispo added that Marsilius had placed his own statue above those of the Caesars, and had set a set bust of Tiberius on another statue for which he had struck off the head of Augustus. And this emperor's wrath blazed forth, and breaking only through his habitual silence, he exclaimed that in such a case, he would himself, to give his vote openly, on his oath, so he must be under the same obligation. There lingered even the few signs of expiring freedom, and so Cnesus Piso asked, In what order will you vote, Caesar? And first I shall know what I follow. If last I fear I may differ you unwillingly. Tiberius was so deeply moved and repenting of the outburst, all the more because of thoughtlessness. He quietly allowed the accusation to be acquitted on the charges of treason. As for the question of extortion, it was referred to a special commission. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 75 not satisfied with judicial proceedings in the Senate, the Emperor would sit at one of the Praetor's tribunal, but so as not to deplace him in the official seat. Many decisions were given to his presence, in opposition and the improper influence and the solicitations of great men. This, though, it is promoted justice, ruined freedom. Pius Aurelius, for example, a senator, complained that the foundations of his house had been weakened by the pressure of a public road and aqueduct, and he appealed to the Senate for existence. He was opposed by the praetors of the treasury, but the emperor helped him, and he paid the value of his house, for he liked to spend money on a good purpose, a virtue which had long retained when all the others had cast it off. To Propateus Seller, an ex-praetor, who sought this because of his indigence to be excused from his rank as a senator, he gave a million sacristies, having ascertained that he had inherited poverty. He bade others, who attempted the same, to prove their cases to the senate. As for his love of strictness, he was harsh even when he acted on the right grounds. Consequently, everyone else preferred silence and poverty to confession and relief. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 76 In the same year, the Tiber, swollen by continuous rains, flooded the level portions of the city. Its subsidence was followed by the destruction of a building and of life. Thereupon, Asinius Gallus proposed to consult the Silbeline books. Tiberius refused veiling the obscurity of the divine as well as the human. However, the devising of means to confine the river was entrusted to Atreus Capilio and Lucius Arunius. Achaia and Macedonia, on complementing the burdens, were, it was decided, to be relieved for a time from the pro government and to be transferred to the emperor. Drusius presided over the show of gladiators, which he gave his own name, and that of his brother Germanius, for he glowed intensely of the bloodshed, however cheap its victims. This was alarming to the populace. And his father had, it was said, rebuked him. Why Tiberius kept him away from the spectacle was variously explained. According to some, it was his loathing of a crowd. According to others, his gloomy temperature. And the fear of contrast with the gracious presence of Augustus, I cannot believe that he deliberately gave his son the opportunity for displaying ferocity and provoking people's disgust, though this was said. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 77 Meanwhile, the unruly tone of the theater which first showed itself in the preceding year, broke out the worst violence and some soldiers and a centurion. Besides, several of the populace were killed, and the tribune of a praetorian cohort was wounded. While they were trying to stop insults to the magistrates and the strife of the mob, this disturbance was the subject of the debate in the Senate, and opinions were expressed in the favor of the praetors, having authority to scourge actors. Hyperius Agrippa, a tribune of the people, interposed his veto, and was sharply censured in a speech by Anselius Gallius, without a word from Tiberius, who liked to allow Senate to show such forms of freedom. Still, the interposition was successful, because Augustus had once pronounced the actors were exempt from the scourge, and it was not lawful for Tiberius to infringe upon his decisions. Many enactments were passed to fix the amount of their pay and check the disobedient behavior of their Parisians. Of these chief were that no senator should enter the house of a pantomime player, that Romans knights should not crowd round them in public streets, and that they should exhibit themselves only in the theater, 
and that praetors should be empowered to punish with banishment any riotous conduct to the spectators. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 78 A request from the Spaniards that they might erect a temple to Augustus, to the colony of Tacaturio, was granted, and a precedent thus given for all provinces. When the people of Rome asked for a remission of 1% tax on all salable commodities, Tiberius declared it by edict that the military executor depended on the branch of revenue and further that the state was unequal to the burden unless the 20th year of service were that to be of the veteran's discharge. Thus, the ill-advised results of the late mutiny, by which the limit of 16 campaigns has been extorted, were cancelled for the future. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 79 a question was then raised in the Senate by Atrinius and Atreus, whether, in order to restrain the inundations of the Tiber, the river and the lakes, which swell its waters, should be diverted from their courses. A hearing was given to the embassies from the municipal towns and colonies, and the people of Florentia begged for the Clanus might not be turned out of its channel and made to flow to the Arenus, as it would bring ruin among themselves. Similar arguments were used by the inhabitants of Interamia. The most fruitful plains of Italy, they said, would be destroyed if the river Nar for this was a plan proposed, were to be divided into several streams and overflow the country. Nor did the people of Rit stay silent. They remonstrated against the closing of the Vilan Lake, where it empties itself into the Nar, as it would burst a flood into the entire neighborhood. Nature had admirably provided for human interests into assigning rivers into their mouths, their channels and their limits, as well as their sources. Regard, too, must be paid for the different religions of the Allies, who dedicated sacred rites, groves, and altars to the rivers of the country. Tiber himself would be altogether unwilling to be deprived of his neighbor's streams and flow with less glory. Either through entreaties of the colonies, with difficult work of superstitious motives prevailed, and they yielded Piso's opinion, who declared himself against any change. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 80 Pompeius Sabinius was continued in his government for the province of Moesa, in addition Acacia, Macedonia, it was part of Tiberius's character to prolong indefinitely military commands and to keep many men into this end of their life in the same armies and the same administrators. Various motives have been assigned for this. Some say that out of aversion for any fresh anxiety, he retained that he had once approved a permanent arrangement. Others, that he grudged to see more enjoying promotion. Some, again, think that he had an accurate intellect. His judgment was irresolute, for he did not seek out eminent merit. And yet he detested vice. From this best man he apprehended danger to himself, from the worst disgrace to the state. He went so far, and at last to his resolution, that he appointed the provinces of men whom he did not mean to allow to leave Rome. The Annals, Book 1, Chapter 81 I can hardly venture on any positive statement about the consular elections, now that head for the first time under this emperor, or indeed subsequently, so conflicting are the accounts of confined in only historians, but in Tiberius' own speeches. Sometimes he hit back the names of the candidates, describing their origin, their life, and military career, so that it might be understood who they were. Occasionally, these hints were withheld, and after urging them not to disturb the elections by canvassing, he would promise his own help towards the result. Generally, he declared that only those that had offered themselves to him as candidates, whose names he had given as the consuls, others that might offer themselves in the confidence in the influence or merit a plausible profession that in this works but really unmeaning and delusive and the greater to disguise the freedom which marked it the more cruel an enslavement into which it would soon plunge us uh so this isn't a chapter this is just me dylan lee fries uh so these last 81 chapters i read out over Roughly three hours, like uh, actually like almost four, four and a half, really. I started at like 12 and it's now 4.28 a.m. So uh, if there's any errors or anything, that's that's why. Um, a basic overview of what happened over this last book, um, if you would like to know, is basically there's Augustus, right? Actually, I'm not sure if that's his name. We're just going to check really quick. It should be around here somewhere. Uh, uh, yeah, Augustus. Um, he's a cool guy, right? So basically he dies. 
He's like this great emperor. Everybody loved him. And he like dies. They're like, oh man, he should be a god. So he's a god. He has like a bunch of children. But he has this like one really like nifty kid called Titicus. And his mom's like kind of like a... I can't say that word. But like you know what I'm like going at. Anyways. um, He has these two main brothers, right? One of them's like a, this Germanus. And the other one is uh, like Brutus. No, it's du uh, Drusus. Drusus. Um, both of them are military commanders, and basically, they both have to deal with revolts, because the soldiers get some time off, because one of the generals is a dingus. Um, and then, you just, like, kind of go through their military campaigns, and it's very boring. Um, and then, that ends after a while, and we just learn more about Titicus. Not Titicus. Oh, fuck, what's his name? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's around here somewhere. Uh, Tiberius. Tiberius' uh, campaigns and shit. Um, and how he worked and how he was a person. How he's kind of like a little shit, you know? Um, yeah. And that's the book.